um, I understand what Justice said. I understand what Paul said. And with me, when people ask us about South Africa, the biggest worry, and it came up to an extent in, in, in Justice's presentation, I can't do the maths. For me, the maths just doesn't add up. Where you've got uh, 27, 28% unemployment, or you've got 17 million people on social grant, and you have a tax base of no more than 500,000 to pay most of the uh, individual taxes. Something's got to give. <laughs> Either we're going to lift the one side or reduce the other side. And uh, to me, that's the worry of, of South Africa. You know, who are we going to put in charge that is actually going to address uh, that algorithm or, 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 those, or, or that issue? I call South Africa new new struggle for liberation, economic liberation, simply because of that. Um, this was the last central bank uh, meeting. No one picked this up, but this worried me. And it comes to the question, this addresses the issue that I've just raised. When uh, Lesetra was talking about the South African economy and reducing interest rates, and the belief is that we're going to get more interest rate uh, deductions, um, what worried him? No one, no one highlighted, the press never highlighted it. It was one sentence. It is unclear where the drivers of accelerated growth will come from in the absence of credible structural policy initiatives. In other words, what's going to drive the economy higher? What in the economy is going to actually allow us to come up without structural changes means really basically changing the way that we do business here? So that, to me, remains our biggest challenge here. Um, have a look. I know Justice was correct to say that the headlines are going to start shrieking out 2.5% growth. Of course, that's uh, quarter on quarter, seasonally adjusted. Um, if you listen to economists, it's unlikely that we're going to get even 1% growth this year. And if you look at that chart, um, this is a chart of the projections of, our, uh, uh, of the economy. We're down last year at 0.3%. Maybe we'll be 0.8% or 1% this year and growing along that dotted line. Still underperforming advanced economy, the world, and certainly emerging markets. And that puts into perspective where we are uh, in, in, in terms of our growth. More worrying is GDP per capita, where um, if you look at that blue line, this is the, um, the blue line is, is global GDP per capita. I don't want to get too technical, but I think these are the worrying things that overall that red line or the red bar is GDP per capita in South Africa, slowly diminishing, slowly decreasing. $5,200 this year, $5,000 next year, in, or this, sorry, in 2017. So we with an economy that's not growing and a population that's growing, sorry, a pop economy not growing, population growing, of course we're going to get poorer. So if you're feeling poorer, that's the truth. You are, you are a lot poorer. I put together also, I love, to, I love to show where we are because South Africa, somehow, we seem to think we're a lot more powerful and a lot bigger than we are. Um, if you look at South Africa, 0.4% of global growth. That really is very little. And what, what's also interesting, when I was putting the slide together and looking at global GDP, I picked up Israel at 0.4%. Now, when I looked at IMF, I thought, no, it can't be that Israel, a land that is smaller than the Kruger National Park, can have a higher GDP than South Africa. Why? We've got platinum mines, we've got gold mines, coal mines, iron ore mines. We've got game reserves, we've got golf courses, we've got, uh, you name it, we've got avo farms, we, we sell wine, we produce wine. How can a country that is basically desert be bigger than South Africa. GDP of $40,000, this is Israel. And I don't bring up Israel because I'm a Zionist, I'm not. <laughs> it's just that when I was doing the maths, their economy matched us. You know, I bought up, it's 0.4%, so are we. How can that country be the same size? And the reason is, and it fits into Paul's analysis, and it fits into uh, what we're going to bring up as well, the reason is it's a skills-based economy. There's nothing else to do in Israel other than learn and develop. So what do they do? They've got uh, military technology, medical technology, communication technology. All of those technologies today 
have made, the sale of those technologies have made Israel a bigger country than South Africa, economic terms. And I, I point it out because it's very much where this country needs to head if we're going to pull ourselves out of the demise and out of the area in which we are at the moment. Um, I'm not going to go into this. It's covered by, uh, by justice. We know what's keeping us back. Um, the big question is, of course, everybody asks, and we see it again today, how come against the backdrop that we're painting, low economic growth, that we still have a dollar rand dollar exchange rate, which is as strong as it is? And there's a simple reason. It's the search for yield. Doesn't matter whether Malema is in charge here, whether uh, Cyril is in charge, whoever takes charge of, of, of the country, it means absolutely nothing. As long as we have high interest rates and interest rates globally remain low, there will be the search for yield and the money will flow in. And it will continue until such time as America starts to change rates and uh, easy monetary policy starts to change. So don't take that as a sign of confidence. Rather, Simply because, um, simply because of, of, of the search for yield and the way that money flows in fast. So that can change very fast. At the moment, it's favorable, and I think we should take advantage of uh, the favorable rates here. With all the background that's been, paste, that, that's been posted, um, one thing that comes across, and I always give an example of, of, uh, of South Africans. Fundamentally, we're very... We're very polite people. We don't like to cause stirs. We go into a restaurant, they give us lousy food, we don't go and punch the chef, we just move out and never come back again. And it's the kind of, it's a kind of attitude here. So what happens with all the problems that South Africa has, with all the pressure on, um, on businessmen, what does business do? It slowly migrates. We take control of our own destiny. And where we no longer trust the government, so what do we do? So have a look at this chart here. This is the JSE today, and I've based this on, on 75 companies. I couldn't fit more in, which make up really 95% of the total market cap. If we look at that, that yellow bar on the left is what I call uh, global consumer. 47% of the JSE today is global consumer. That's the big companies like ABN, Bev, Richemont, etc. Companies that... Do not do any business in South Africa. I'll repeat that. Do not do any business in South Africa. Completely foreign-based. We then come into resources, 17%. Financials, 14%. Local consumer, 5.3%. And I look at local consumer because what's happened? Stars being listed. We've got MassMart. We've got Mr. Price. We've got all those um, pick and pay. You name them. Spa. We spend a huge amount of time Analyze them then, comment on them. 5.3% of the JSC. Telecoms, 2.3 and so on, down to local property and foreign, pop and foreign property. But overall, the JSC accounts for at least 65%. For, uh, sorry, foreign companies make up at least 65% of the JSC today, which means there's 35% that is influenced by all the other factors um, yeah, all the other economic factors. I've listed the ones that are predominantly in, in, in the right-hand corner. So where am I leading to? Where does this lead to and why? What is this raised? So I've taken five years of the JSE and I put it into, ran, into dollar terms. And the interesting thing, having looked at this chart, the S&P has outperformed the JSE in dollar terms by over 80%. Okay. 80%. So if you were in the S&P in dollars and you were in the JSE in dollars, you were 80% poorer. But that doesn't make sense. It doesn't make sense because why? I've just told you that 65% of the JSE is foreign-owned. In other words, we're a foreign index. So why the difference? Why? We've been telling our clients for how long? Don't worry, if you remain in the JSC, you've got Rand hedges, you're well protected. No, you haven't been. And why? Well, this is the top, the most valuable companies in the JSC. It's changed slightly. Unfortunately, I've been away a couple of weeks and I couldn't update it uh, to, to what's happened. But if you look, all those companies in yellow are 
foreign companies. ABM, Bev, British American Tobacco, Nasbest, Glencore, Richmond, Billiton, Steinhoff, you name it, Sassel. Two companies in green there first ran. So fundamentally, 10 most valuable companies on the JSE are foreign based. But have a look at the US. 10 most valuable companies there. <coughs> Apple, Alphabet, Microsoft, Amazon, Facebook, Berkshire, Johnson & Johnson, Exxon, JP Morgan, Wells Fargo. It's changed slightly in the bit. But the top five companies were not there 10 years ago. Well, they might have been. Maybe, maybe one of them, Microsoft, might have been in the top, uh, top five. They're all tech companies. They're all, all tech companies that have grown dramatically over the last, um, over the last 10 years. And if you'd put $100 using, using those, top, those 20 companies that I've given you, if you'd put $100 into those companies five years ago, what would your returns be? Have a look. Facebook, 493. Amazon, 433. Nasdaq, 370. And that's 10 cents. And we know the debacle. Funny enough, if you would have bought 10 cents, you would have been top of the pops. You would have actually been above all of them. If you would have been 10 cents, not necessarily. But Alphabet, JP Morgan, and of course we get the bottom at the we get uh, our companies at the bottom. Right at the bottom, $100 in, in Billiton five years ago, 58. $100 in, in Sassel, 67. So, of course, where does this lead to? It's, it comes back to what Paul was talking about, how technology is enriching the lives of hundreds of millions of people and how it's changing us and how it's fast transforming industries and threatening to displace uh, millions of jobs in the next decade. It's very interesting to hear Paul mention the number of about 40%. Of course, we're not going to lose all jobs, but what it is going to do is it's going to change the whole way that we operate uh, into the future. And you can't afford to ignore it when it comes to actually your own investment. You can't go backwards and look backwards into an old economy because in the next five and ten years, Things are going to change. I'm not going to go through uh, all the slides that are prepared. It's a, it was covered extensively by Paul, but I will fast track to, to one or two other things. I did want to say this, though. When we do look at robots, he works 24 hours a day, does whatever he's asked to do. He doesn't get sick or take leave. He doesn't get emotional, and he doesn't ask you to share profits with him. So um, it makes a strong case um, for robotics, no matter whether it comes to the choice that that Paul was mentioning. But I think, I think just to illustrate examples of how it is changing our way and how um, it's coming to every aspect of our business, um, I picked up this from a Financial Times article not too long ago where a, um, a PhD student had developed a program to take on four professional poker players. And initially the program, initially this artificial intelligent program, started losing. It was a 20-day binge of, uh, of poker. Initially, it started losing. But as the days went by, the program or this computer or robot, whatever you want to call it, began to learn to an extent where it started to bluff. And at the end of the 20-day binge, it had taken all the chips from four professional poker players and left them literally with nothing. And it's an idea, it's, it's just a, it's, it's, it's a, sorry, an example of how computers can learn even the most complex or random, random stuff. I've got a smart world as well. Paul has, has picked up a lot on that, and I'm just going to be repeating uh, what he is saying. But I think there are another examples which maybe he didn't really, um, really bring up. Is that um, the, what I wanted to bring up is that where robots and where artificial intelligence will make a big may is, is where we're starting to see population growth decline. I know we talk about China, but the one-child policy will decrease or have important aspects on the working population down the line. And of course, in those areas or those instances where we're getting Canada, Germany, France, Italy, China, Japan, UK, and US, as the population ages, so you will find more manufacturing businesses and more businesses turning towards robotics and turning towards uh, issues like in, uh, artificial intelligence. Um, 
the one question we never brought up with him and I wanted to ask was about autonomous motor vehicles. And as I say, soon this will replace this. This is the one area in which we're starting to see a huge amount uh, of development taking place. And there the stats that are coming through are, are quite dramatic um, in that something like 5 million driving is something like the biggest occupation or biggest uh, employer of males in the United States, from lorry drivers to, to uh, truck drivers to taxi drivers and so on. And don't think, when, when, when Paul actually mentioned the, uh, uh, the, the phone, the, the iPhone is celebrating its uh, 10th anniversary now, and they're coming out with the iPhone 8, which will be released next week, uh, which is going to be a bomber. It's going to be a huge um, improvement. It's 10 years since we've had the iPhone. And I'm just going to ask you, who in this audience has an iPhone? And who realize, look, you know, vir no, you, you can't put up your hand. It's not a school. I mean, I know virtually every person here does have an iPhone. And 10 years ago, no one thought that you would be in a position where you are absolutely attached by the umbilical cord to this phone. You cannot do anything without it. So don't think that the autonomous cars or something like this is not going to happen. The big question is everybody's cynical about whether or not the uh, technology will take place. Probably not here, but uh, uh, certainly uh, down the line. So I'm going to end off uh, really on something else that is, I think, important in the whole aspect of this. Uh, of, of technology, and that's understanding young people and understanding how they're going to change the world as well as we embrace, uh, as we embrace technology. As I say, the next guardians of, of global capital, it's absolutely, I, d I don't think they're any different. I know everybody says they think differently and so on. I don't think they're any differently. I think this is an aged audience. I don't think there's, uh, you know, if you look around, there are a lot of old people here, and even these old people, <laughs> Even these old people in the audience um, have got iPhones and wake up in the morning and check to see whether there are any messages. Well, it's not only millennials. I think that as time goes by, of course, as the day goes by, the millennials tend to look at it probably more often. But it doesn't mean that we're any less attached to these uh, iPhones um, uh, you know, as in the past. But what's, what's fascinating about the millennials is that the money that has been accumulated by the baby boomers is going to pass on to the millennials. And those millennials have a completely different way of life to the older generation. I think that came through in Paul when he mentioned the uh, uh, Industrial Revolution to the, fourth in you know, to the fourth Industrial Revolution. The way that things have changed, the way that we're going to work in the future, and even the kinds of of attitudes that the, uh, that, you know, that, that, that the baby boomers uh, will have. Um, in many cases, technology, they, we, just looking at this audience, we're somewhere between uh, digital converts or to digital dinosaurs, I'm not sure, but we're not digital natives. And a digital native is a baby boomer, uh, sorry, is a millennial who was born with technology. In other words, knows a world, doesn't know a world without technology. Whereas we've had to learn to adopt technology for them at second nature. And likewise, for, for a lot of people, other people, they're absolute dinosaurs and uh, uh, ignore it completely. But because of their way that they've grown up, it means that they do things uh, in a completely different, uh, a different way. Um, they communicate differently, they buy differently. Uh, their choices are completely different. What's very interesting, and they're much more conscious of the world than we were. I didn't know what the term LGBT meant. I've learned it subsequently. But for them, it's nothing. You know, for them to embrace uh, those, those kind of identity issues is absolutely nothing. They don't like to buy things. They want to rent things. Uh, in the, in when, when I was growing up, and I'm a child of the 60s, um, with us, it was free love and uh, Jimi Hendrix, and uh, you know, you wanted to go live on a farm and grow weed or whatever it was like this. I wasn't there. Today, it's totally different. You want to live in a big city, you want to ride a bicycle, and you want to eat sushi. So it's uh, it's things have changed completely from their point of view. When they buy something, 
they don't rely on advertising. They look at the, they, they, they go onto sites to see what it's been rated by their, their uh, um, peers. Have you ever gone onto Netflix? What do you do? You don't watch a movie with two stars. It's got to have at least four or five stars. If it's got two stars, you ignore it. That's the way that the population work, the, new p uh, the, the millennials work. So if a product comes out, they will look to see what it's been rated. Go on to booking.com, hotel two stars, not going there. Four, five stars, whatever the ratings are. So the whole way of communicating and the whole way that we're doing business and buying things today is completely different. Amazon, I went into an Amazon store now in, in New York. Uh, they've started a store now, and it was in Columbus Circle in New York City. And what fascinated me was how they use technology in the store. I said, why a store? What they've done and how they're now developing the stores is that they will know where they are in Columbus Circle on the west side of New York, and they will see what people in the area have bought. So they go into their database, know what kind of books, and those are the books that they stack. And uh, those are the kind of books... So the stores actually become an out, uh, uh, almost a, a shop. As Paul said, you know, you like to go down for your coffee downstairs instead of the free coffee. You like to go there. They like to, people like to go and uh, sometimes look at the books, but to buy them at prime prices or at, um, or at uh, what do you call it, at the Kindle prices rather than the major prices at all. So I think the point I'm trying to illustrate is that, that the new generation approach life and approach business in a completely way that, w that, 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 that we do. And that includes uh, the kind of jobs that they want to do. I know from our firm, you know, you can see the complete different attitudes of the youngsters that come to work, want to go early, want to have an easy way out, of etc. instead of the old type of... <laughs> work. Anyway. Um, it is, yeah. <laughs> they buy differently. They buy differently, you know, that completely different attitude towards, and I think this is something that we've got to have to be aware of. You know, UBS, um, Paul's not here, but when I went to a conference there, it was a year or two ago, one of their biggest problems, one, and this applies to all of you, this applies to all of us here, they said that 85% of the children of their clients do not want to deal with them. In other words, want their own advisors, are going to do their own thing. And for us, that becomes a massive challenge. How do we hold on to the clients or to the children of our clients? Simply, their approach is, is completely different to the way that we used to do things, uh, uh, you know, in, in certainly in investment. And it's something that we have to address. Um, there are other dominant themes, and I'll quickly go through them, that are are changing the way that we approach the market at the moment. Of course, a growing middle class. To me, you can't ignore what's happening in, in China, in India, the growth of people in those areas. They're traveling. I was, I, as I say, I was in New York, and I went down to Washington. Um, Washington was full of travelers from India and from Asia. I was absolutely bombed off by the number of people that were actually there. And it's an irony. Here we are in Trump's backyard, literally, across the road from the White House, and everybody that he's against is actually visiting. You know, he's against anybody from outside. He's, uh, you know, keep everything in. And this is the crazy thing, is that you know his attitude towards immigrants. All the food trucks in the area were halal. They were Mexican food trucks, uh, everything other than uh, burgers and chips and whatever, or fries, etc., all catering for the foreign tourists or for the people who live there. And the irony of ironies was that all the accessory stores that are along there were run by Chinese. And the Make American Great caps and the Make American Great t-shirts made in China. So, <laughs> you know, rather odd to see, and that's something that you can't, um, you know, that, that, that you can't stop. But the point I'm making is that the growth of the middle class in, in Asia is beginning to change the whole global economy. They're traveling. Have a look at Airbus. Have a look at Boeing. Have a look at the number of, of aircraft that are on order there. 
millions are trading, uh, you know, literally, I think 130 chi million Chinese are expected to leave the mainland now and start to travel. It opens up huge kinds of uh, uh, opportunities, not only in consumption, but in, but, but, but in travel. The other two things is as we grow older, uh, disease becomes more prevalent. Diseases that we didn't know before in oncology and obesity as well. Uh, of course, um, both of those are going to uh, trigger or uh, spark a huge amount of research to address those issues as the incidence of cancer, obesity, starts to outstrip the uh, uh, growth in population or cer certainly GDP. Rise of renewables, um, regardless of Trump, I think you've got a new generation of people who actually want to do the right thing, who don't want to burn dirty fuel, uh, who want to do uh, use renewable energy, etc. And the choices are now coming from the companies themselves. And of course, demographic chips, uh, uh, shifts that are taking place uh, that are going to transform the whole way that we do business. I'm running out of time. I said I'll be quarter past four, which is all we have, etc. But I, I, ju I just want to end off on uh, marketer's dream. Uh, if we look at Facebook, Google, Amazon, if you start to look at the numbers, they're quite staggering uh, as to how they have transformed uh, the way that we do business. And when I say a marketer's dream, why is all of this a marketer's dream and why do we like companies like that? Simply how accessible it is. Every one of you is sitting with a smartphone. If I want to get hold of you or I want to advertise, I don't have to put a billboard or I don't have to put it on radio, etc. We merely have to know that you hear from the signal to send you some kind of message of what's happening in the area and so on. Um, so what does it look like? What are the themes that are driving the global economy? Um, I've written up there. I'm not going to go through it. I don't want to keep you any longer. The yawns are starting to happen now. And uh, it's time for drinks and coffee and, and snacks and so on. Um, I did want to just point out one thing, though. Um, when we talk about South Africa and we talk about, the uh, we talk about uh, where we are, how do we bridge that gap? that I mentioned. How do we now transform uh, an old type of economy into a new type economy? You know, how do we catch up with the S&P? And, you know, listening to, to Justice, he says five years, ten years, etc. But I think in those five to ten years, we have to think a lot smarter than we have. The opportunities are there. Africa is open. MTN went in there. Vodacom went in, in, in there. But I think for us, the challenge is to try and get into there and also to open up businesses that actually embrace new technology and try and, and forget about the way that we did things, but try and in include or uh, you know, uh, bring in new types of technology that we can actually export into Africa and bring Africa, uh, uh, align Africa with the, with the kind of uh, movement that's happening in the rest of the world. So I'm going to leave it there. Um, you might pick up from what we're saying that... Uh, um, our whole strategy is directed towards diversifying portfolios. We continue to believe in diversification, not because of what's happening in South Africa, not because uh, of, of the economy, but rather the kind of choices that are available to us in, in, a, in, in, uh, in a global economy, uh, in a global stock market. The far better choices than we have here on our market, despite the fact that we keep saying that our companies are good and are well protected against any kind of uh, uh, depreciation of the RAND or any kind of uh, other issues, political issues that, are, that, that happen here. I'm going to leave it there quickly. I don't know if there are any questions. If there are, too bad. We'll answer them outside. <laughs> You've had enough, so have we. But uh, really, I just want to thank you so much for coming here and uh, you know, just for making today a success. And really... I've got to thank Paul and Justice for uh, the high quality of their talks and uh, uh, representing us in that way. Thank you.